So thanks very much, Etchen. Thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, to speak today. Uh, really is appreciated. Um, um, I'm going to talk about Hive Alive, obviously. Going to talk about seaweeds, bee health, and the SEMA. Um, hopefully, someone, hopefully, everyone will get something out of it. Um, and I, I won't be talking very long time. Um, it'll probably be about half an hour. So we've plenty of time for questions. If people want to ask questions afterwards. Um, Oh yeah, down here. Um, sorry, this thing's popping up the whole time with the, with the, uh, the, the mini screen. Um, there, I'll, I'll, I should be able to manage it. Just wait two seconds. Manage it. Okay, so my name's Dara Scott. Um, I'm beekeeper for over 20 years and um, I'm living in Ireland, based in Ireland. Um, I, I'm involved, involved in setting up the Connemara uh, Beekeeping Association and also the Native Irish Honeybee Association. Um, I keep, as I was saying to Etchen earlier, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't do so much honey, it's more nooks I produce. I produce nooks, overwinter them and sell them early in the spring is my main beekeeping habit. Um, trying not to get honey. I'm sick of getting honey, but I keep on getting it. This year I was adamant I wouldn't get honey because uh, I just, just don't have the time for it. But of course, there was they just wouldn't stop producing honey this year, just the way the year went. Um, but that's okay. Um, so I have a background in science. I have a degree in physics. I worked in R&D in the medical device industry, and I spent 10 years um, working in marine research. I started developing Hive Alive in 2008 and uh, it was launched then in 2012. We spent quite a bit of time on research. Um, since then, it's really grown from strength to strength. Uh, we're in over 40 countries. It's, it's the, the most popular bee supplement in the world at this point. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's only the last year or two of any sort of marketing budget, because uh, this is a niche, uh, industry, niche, niche product in a niche industry. It's really been word of mouth of beekeepers who, who use it, like it, find it the year after the bees are doing better. And, and then spread the word on that. So, um, today what I'm going to talk about is Hive Alive, what's in it, and then seaweeds, why do we choose to put seaweeds in it, um, the reasons behind that, and then results of international trials that we run on Hive Alive. Um, I'll go through those, and then some quick info on how to use Hive Alive, some of the benefits, uh, and then Again, at the end, just a quick uh, uh, introduction to the two new products of Hive Life that we have developed. So, first off, for those of you who don't know what Hive Alive is, it's a concentrated liquid feed supplement for bees uh, to maintain their colony strength. Uh, it's available in a range of different sizes. Um, the 100 ml bottle is the smallest bottle that feeds 10 hives, and the largest bottle is the 10 liters, and that feeds uh, a, a thousand colonies. Um, it's made in Ireland uh, following strict manufacturing guidelines by the Department of Agriculture, which in turn are guided by the uh, EU. So it's EU approved and it's fully FDA compliant. And what's in Hive Alive? So the bulk of Hive Alive is made up with our unique uh, blend of seaweed extracts called OSHA Shield, and it also contains thymol and lemongrass. And I'll talk about all those as we go along. So um, we were the pioneers in integrating seaweeds into, uh, into bee feeds. There's now one or two other people who are doing something similar. Um, but Ocean Shield, we still are unique in that we're using a, a unique blend of extracts from a number of different seaweeds uh, that are specifically chosen for honeybee health. Um, di these different extracts have different uh, properties such as antifungal, antibacterial or immune stimulatory, depending on the species that we use. And to extract them and to maintain the bioactivity, we use a, a patented cold process technique. And this process will preserve, observes and concentrates the actives pulled out of the seaweeds, meaning that a little of it goes a long way. Our seaweeds also naturally have like micronutrients, vitamins, salts, minerals, and polysaccharides. Um, we have lemongrass in the product. You've probably heard lemongrass before. It's used in beekeeping. It calms the bees and it makes sugar syrup attract to them. We believe we've got the right amount of, of le lemongrass incorporated into it, enough so that it's attractive, it makes the syrup more attractive than ordinary syrup to the bees, 
but not too much where you know other products that, that that they can cause robbing and robbing can be a big issue for for and obviously nobody wants robbing in their colonies so we don't have reports of of, of robbing with 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 hive alive um yeah hive alive is also antimicrobial but not not a huge amount so, well not the concentrations we're using it at um and hive alive also contains thymol Thymol has been, it's, yeah, it's over 100 years now that thymol has been used uh, as a treatment for, uh, uh, or a home remedy, should we say, um, for uh, Nasima. Uh, um, Manly was the one who came up with that. And, um, but the drawbacks of thymol is that it's easily can separate out of syrup. And when it separates out of syrup, because the higher concentration at the bottom, and they can give too high a concentration for the bees, and they either won't take it or make them sick. So we have developed a unique emulsification process uh, to ensure that it blends easily into the sugar syrup and it doesn't separate out and doesn't cause any recrystallization. So seaweeds. Why seaweeds? Well, as a background to seaweeds, they've eaten by, by, by humans for, for over 18,000 years and pretty much anywhere seaweeds are available and they've been documented for food and, and for medicinal use. The, uh, the long-lived Japanese are famous for eating seaweed in food like sushi and where I'm from, Ireland has a long history of seaweed use, whether it's feeding to animals or uh, as, as a fertilizer, uh, in, in, especially in the west of Ireland where I'm from where the soil isn't very good, seaweed is used um, there's there's an island just off off the road, uh, just 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 off from where we live, where it's it's all rock, and uh, they they grow their potatoes and grow everything basically through seaweed, and because there's very little soil there at all, there at all, and they grow very good potatoes. Um, so in uh, in Ireland, um, we have we use one species of seaweed as as a as a sort of a medicine. It's it's mixed with honey and lemon. It's a medicine for colds and, and flu and bronchitis. Uh, and I thought this was only an Irish tradition, but I discovered that this, this remedy, the same remedy using seaweed uh, and honey and lemon is also used in a number of different countries around the world. Um, nearly every country that has access to seaweeds has used them as medicines, um, from Malaysia to the Caribbean, from New Zealand to North America, Greece, Japan, they've all had a wide range of medicinal uses from lung disease to gut parasites to tumors and fun things like syphilis. Um, They've been, it's been used as a medicine. So, and more recently, scientists have discovered that individual seaweed extracts have been found to be beneficial in, in, in humans for digestive health, in tackling diseases such as diabetes, um, osteoporosis, and even, even cancers as well. So, seaweed and animals. Um, a lot of animals eat seaweeds naturally, um, but up until recently, they weren't generally used in animal feeds. Um, whole or fermented seaweeds have been fed to animals traditionally, but uh, for, for their nutritional content, really. Um, but it's only since uh, the science has become more advanced that we know exactly which parts of seaweed are most beneficial uh, for the animals, and, and more importantly, how to extract those, those parts of the seaweed. Uh, since this, this discovery, the, the demand for seaweed extracts uh, for animal feeds has, has rapidly increased. Um, very interesting compounds are now extracted from seaweeds. Uh, and for instance, seaweeds have large amounts of polysaccharides. Um, polysaccharides are, are, are complex sugar molecules that can do lots of amazing things. A lot of research going on in polysaccharides at the moment. Um, but they can do things like protect, protect the gut lining or help support um, uh, good um, um, bacteria in the gut. They, they, they're, they're considered prebiotics, uh, which is the, 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 the food that, that the bacteria likes to live off. A uh, number of seaweeds also have um, excellent antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral properties. And um, more recently discovered seaweeds have been shown to have uh, immune stimulatory properties, which can help uh, animals better defend against uh, disease. So, um, all these benefits uh, lead to better overall animal health as a result of having better animal health. Uh, their productivity is increased. So seaweeds are now tailored uh, to specific, tailored to the specific animal for specific properties. So for instance, in fish farming, uh, seaweed extracts have been fed that reduce the attachment of the parasitic lice. Um, in beef, beef farming or, or cattle farming, extracts are fed to increase uh, weight gain, improve gut health, nutrient absorption, reproductive health, and, and milk quality. 
Um, same is done for horses, sheep, pigs, poultry, uh, and it's even now fed to, to, to pets like dogs and cats. And interestingly, since we developed Hive Alive uh, and started selling Hive Alive, we've been told by lots of beekeepers that they've seen uh, bees feeding off seaweeds. So it's clear that seaweeds are beneficial to animals and humans, but what about honeybees? So as a bit of background, um, so previous research had discovered that certain seaweed extracts were, were good at blocking the entry of the malarial parasite into human cells. So a group of uh, French researchers uh, wondered, could this theory be applied to honeybees? Uh, they set up experiments to find out if feeding seaweed uh, polysaccharides could block the attachment of the SEMA cells that causes intestinal issues from bees. And they found that by feeding different seaweed polysaccharides, the SEMA was reduced and the honeybee survival was improved. Um, the researchers said that the seaweeds are able to reduce the SEMA by blocking the adhesion of the SEMA spores to the gut wall, thus stopping their life cycle. And they also said that seaweeds may improve survival decrease spore, and decrease spore levels by activating the immune response. Now, I suppose I'm going to talk about Nesema a bit. Um, so and I know a lot of the thinking, particularly maybe in America, is that, that Nesema isn't really a problem uh, in, in colonies. You can have high levels and the colonies can still be fine. Um, but I, I'm sure Mark will talk about this later, but, but having a couple of million spores replicating the lining of, of your bee gut uh, and destroying epithelial cells, the gut lining, has to have an effect on, on bee health and bee productivity. Um, it, 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 in a perfect environment, um, the bees seem to be able to cope with the seam if they have enough food. Um, but, but it's beekeeping, you never know what's going to happen next, uh, and you never know what stress is going to come around the corner for your colony. And, and either way, the more the seam that you have, uh, the less productive, less productive your bees are going to be. I, th I think personally that part of the problem is that Varroa is such a huge problem that it masks the effect in the SEMA. Um, like for instance, in Australia, where up until only a few months ago, they didn't have any Varroa, the SEMA was the key uh, uh, pathogen for, for, for bees in, in, in Australia. Um, and also, I think when I show you the data that we have on Hive Alive, you'll see the does seem to correlation again between keeping the SEMA levels low and bee productivity. Oh yeah, before I forget, uh, we've got, it's a small co a competition just to kind of uh, uh, stop you guys from falling asleep, listen to me basically. So I'll, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask uh, a question at the end of the talk based on what I've talked about. Uh, if you guys just wanna email us the answer and we'll put every correct answer into a draw. If you email to info at hivelivebees.com, I'll give you that at the end anyway, the email address. And we're gonna do uh, a box of fondant box of pollen patties and a two liter bottle of Hive Alive, so three different prizes. Uh, and we'll give it away. We'll, we'll send it to you as soon as we're back in stock. We're actually completely sold out of everything of Hive Alive at the moment. We, we expected a really big push this autumn or this fall, and it was far bigger than we could have even anticipated. So we're, we're back in stock of everything within the next two weeks. Uh, I think probably the liquid's gonna come back first, but um, anyway, that's the competition we will, um, We'll, we'll, I'll ask the question at the end of the talk and um, email it in and hopefully you'll be able to win something. So why would beekeepers want to feed Hive Alive? The four biggest reasons we give for using Hive Alive is that the beekeeper will get reduced disease levels, in particular Nosema, more bees, more honey and improved overwinter survival. So Hive Alive has been shown to reduce Nosema levels and it's the only product proven to maintain low Nosema levels long-term. Um, you might think your colonies don't have a problem with Nosema, but it's nearly always there in colonies. Um, some people wait till they see a problem with Nosema, but of course with the new Nosema, it's not really new anymore, but with Nosema serrani, there, there are really generally no obvious symptoms. Uh, and the time you realize your colony is compromised or sick, it could be too late for the colony to recover. Uh, it's been consistently shown that bees that have Nosema did not perform as well as colonies that do, uh, that, sorry, consistently shown that uh, colonies that have Nosema do not perform as well as colonies that do not have Nosema. So colonies with Nosema have been shown to be more vulnerable to external factors like stress, pesticides, food shortages. These are all published, published papers and Hive Alive offers ongoing protection here. Hive Alive has been shown to give uh, more bees. Trials have demonstrated a significant increase in colony population when Hive Alive is fed. 
And again, probably as a result of this increase in colony population, colonies uh, fed hive life consistently higher honey yields. A lot of beekeepers feed hive alive in the autumn to help their colonies survive the winter, and trials demonstrate increased survival rates in the groups that are fed hive alive. So let's look at some trial results to, you guys can make sure we're not just making this up. Um, these I'll show you a couple of trials here. Uh, the, the first one is uh, performed by the top bee researchers in, in the world and is published in the Journal of Apiculture Research. Um, and in this, uh, this graph here, we're looking at uh, spore counts, Nacima spore counts over time. Um, there were two groups in the trial. There was the control group and then there was the hive alive group. And the only difference to, between the control group and the hive alive is that the syrup fed uh, to the hive alive group had hive alive syrup added to it. They were all fed exactly the same amount of syrup, but the only difference was that the hive alive was added to the syrup of the hive alive group. Um, and you can see here over time that the uh, pointer going here. You can see over, oops, wrong slide. Da, 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 da. Over time, that the, the Nacima levels start off uh, about the same, and over time, the difference between the two gets larger and larger. So over time, the, the, there's less Nacima spores in the high of live group than there is over in, in the control group. Um, they end up with about 56 or 57 percent less uh, Nacima spores than the control. And, and this is statistically significant data, so that the the um, this isn't like chance or error. This is this is this is um, pretty much hard fact. Um, so, yeah, it's over time. It's important to stress that it doesn't happen or, or, or straight away. And it, 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 you can see it again. The the change is, is gradual over multiple time points. Um, we lots of beekeepers are telling this as well. And down below, we have a quote there from uh, Donald Tweeddale, who's one of the biggest uh, Manuka producers in New Zealand. He said, we test our bees in Asima during spring and have found that it has a, a very low or non-detectable level serrani when feeding hive alive. So this is um, looking at- you know what to do with it, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, someone's talking there. Just uh, if you want to mute, maybe please. Um, so, um, unless you want to ask me a question, but um, so this is the this is uh, looking at the, the population change over time uh, in the same uh, study. So again, they start off uh, about even, and over time, you see the hive alive group uh, starts getting larger and larger compared to the control. Again, the only difference here is that hive alive was added to the syrup, the same amount of syrup was fed to both. Uh, and the green bars here are the percentage difference in colony population from uh, compared from hive alive compared to the, the control. So you can see at the end of this, this is about a year and a half that the the the, um, the hive alive group end up eighty nine percent more bees than the control group. Uh, and we get lots of sort of testimonials from beekeepers saying that they're seeing big increases in population. Uh, are, are their colonies doing well, really well? Are, are very strong. Um, Yeah, so that's that's population increase. And this is another trial that was run. Um, and uh, again, looking at population increase. So again, same sort of deals before, they were fed the same amount of sugar syrup. The only difference is that the control, that, that the hive alive group had hive alive added to their sugars, to their sugar syrup. And you can see again that over time. The, the, the population increase does get larger and larger. And then it comes to winter, they drop back down again uh, to, to about the same. And then next next year again, the difference is bigger again than it was the first year. And uh, here we've got a 22% increase in population. In this study, we also looked at honey production and um, started off again at the same. Over time, you can see that the that the that the hive live group starts increasing in honey population the first first year, and then the second year they start increasing, and the number gets bigger and bigger again. In this case, there was a forty five percent increase in honey uh, uh, population, and again another quote from a New Zealand uh, large uh, honey producer in New Zealand: On average, production per hive is approximately twenty five percent more 
and the hives are more consistent in their production. Uh, so now talking about overwinter survival, um, in, in the original trial, the control group had 15% uh, losses where the hive live group didn't have any. And we believe this due to the fact that the hives are stronger and healthier going into winter and better able to defend against disease. Starting winter with a healthier gut is obviously important due to the fact that bees are not able to get out for, for many cleansing fights. Um, and a lot of beekeepers have reported similar findings so some quotes up here. We, someone who's, who's the colonies were fed with hive alive last year only at 15 percent losses so far compared to 25 percent for the rest uh another one my colony loss rate during last year's brutal winter was about 10 to 15 percent other beekeepers in the province had over uh, winter losses of 50 percent in their colonies so i'm not guaranteeing any big changes like that there's a huge number but but it does consi have consistently uh better over winter success with hive alive so just to give you an example of one of the methods of how Hive Alive does help, um, this, this is showing the SEMA spore. So I'm going to show this, I'll take a second to talk about this slide. So um, if, you, if you look here, you can see these are the big things here are pollen grains and the smaller things in amongst the blob of liquid are the SEMA spores. I hopefully you can see those on your screen. So the top row is just ordinary syrup and the bottom row is syrup uh, with Hive Alive. So basically, these spores were suspended in syrup um, the, for a couple of weeks. Uh, the top one is ordinary syrup, and the bottom one, the spores, is suspended in ordinary syrup with high alive at feeding concentration. Uh, and what happened then is they were taken out, and they a dye was added to them, a fluorescing dye that under a fluorescing microscope, uh, it will fluoresce; it'll it'll light up. Um, and the, the the theory being is that if the spore walls are um, missing the spore walls have been compromised, the dye is able to go in them, and the spore wall will the spores will fluoresce. You'll be able to see them. Uh, and if the if the spores are still intact, still viable, uh, they the dye won't be able to get into them, and uh, and they won't fluoresce. So when the control one, the one that didn't have the hive alive, you can see the pollen grains fluorescing. But you can't see any Nosema spores in here fluorescing. You see there's lots of spores here, but they're just not fluorescing here. With the Hive Alive group, um, you can see that the spores that are here are now bright, uh, bright pink. These little dots here all within, within, within the, this image. And that's because the spore wall has been compromised. Uh, the, the, the dye is able to get in there and basically those spores are dead. So we've also done some work on in vitro work on fowl brood and on chalk brood. So this is basically using Hive Alive again at a feeding concentration. The, the, I'll talk about that in a second, but at the normal feeding concentration. And these are petri dishes. And on the left hand side is the control, and the right hand side is the Hive Alive uh, 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 petri dish. So on the left hand side, uh, you can see all these little grey dots. That is the, 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 the American fowl brood growing in, in the culture here. And on the right hand side here, you can see that there is zero gray dots because zero of the fowl brood actually grew uh, in the petri dish because there was hive alive added to it. Same over here on the right hand side, you can see where the original test stops of, 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 of the Ascopharis was added here and here. Uh, uh, but you see the whole thing now is all covered in, 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 in the fungus. It's all got that white kind of blue moldy cheesy fungus all around the whole petri dish. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see where the two dot, dots of tester um, were put on uh, and you can see how it just didn't grow at all. Again, this is a feeding concentration of hive alive, not like some increased dosage. Now, does American fowl, does hive alive cure American fowl? No, it definitely does not be very clear about that. But what it does do is it keeps pathogens levels low in the colony. I bet you, if you, you analyze nearly every hive, it's going to have one or two spores of fowl brood in it. And it's all about the colony being able to maintain a healthy colony and keep that, those spores repressed uh, and not let a, a pathogen build up in a colony that, it, that it, it inhibits it, reduces productivity, or, or, or compromises its, its health. And that's what Hive Live is doing. It, 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 it's helping colonies stay, stay healthy. And finally, in the trials, um, this is one of the first trials we did in Italy, um, the Hive research in Italy. 
Um, this was a decayed trial where uh, on day seven, uh, they were fed spores. And then on day 14, they were, it was looked at and the, the, the high of alive group had half number of spores as the control group. But more importantly, maybe is, this is what's showing, this graph here is showing that the, the addition of the seaweed extract made that efficacy far more efficacious than the seaweed extract wasn't in hive alive. So um, how to use Hive Alive? Hive Alive is simple to use. Uh, for those who are on metric, it's 2.5 uh, mils of Hive Alive per liter of syrup, uh, basically two teaspoons of Hive Alive per gallon. Um, we recommend feeding a minimum of four liters of one gallon of Hive Alive, but, but ideally all syrup uh, that you feed has Hive Alive into, in it. Uh, you can feed it in the autumn and the spring, uh, but if you're only going to feed it once, by far and away, the best time to feed it is in the autumn, because what it's doing is, is, the, is it's obviously when it's being stored in the comb, it's breaking down any of the pathogens, but also the bees are eating it for a longer period of time. Uh, and so it's in their gut for a longer period of time, so, that, so it's, it's protecting them for that longer period of time over the winter time. Um, okay, so, um, Hive Alive can also be added to protein patties and to candy or fondant or sugar boards, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, if you're adding it to protein patties, we recommend a one teaspoon per pound of patty. Uh, if you're adding it to, to sugar boards or anything that's going to be hot, uh, it's important that the temperature of the, 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 the sugar that you're, or whatever medium you're adding it to needs to be below 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if if you're um, so if you're the, the whole idea there is is that if if you add above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the bioactive and hive alive will get damaged. So so this, you, you want to add it when when it's not hot at hive alive when it's when the, the the syrup or whatever is not hot. Um, people use hive alive to spray to calm bees instead of smoke. Um, but, uh, and, and other bee groups have told us about, you can put it on, on, on old frames to hers them to draw out foundation or, or new foundation. Uh, and they just brush or spray it on and that's nice and easy to do. Of course, Hive Alive increased the attractiveness of, of uh, syrup to be, uh, of the syrup for the, increase the attractiveness of the syrup to, uh, to bees, um, which can help speed them take it down a bit quicker. Last one here. It also prevents syrup from fermenting. Um, this is two big advantages. The first one is, is if you're feeding, it starts getting cold quickly and the bees don't have time to um, dehydrate all that sugar syrup uh, uh, and cap it off. What you'll have is, is, is sugar syrup sitting in, in, in combs sit, uh, and which is the possibility going, of fermenting at some stage or going bad at some stage. With Hive Alive, it's not gonna go bad. It'll stay there, it'll be fine. And it's not gonna make the bees sick. Also, if you make up too much hive, too much syrup that has hive alive in it, that isn't a problem either because it's not going to go bad. It's not going to go moldy. It's not going to get your gear moldy. Um, and you can store the syrup till later on. You can use it if you're making up in, in, in the autumn time, you can use it again in the springtime, no problem. I've used it. It keeps well good for over, over six months. Um, and of course, it's useful for the introduction of new queens. The, the smell of hive alive can help mask the pheromone. Um, um, with master queen pheromones, so it's easier to introduce queens. Just to quickly compare Hive Alive versus other feeding supplements, um, Hive Alive is still the only feed supplement with scientific proof using large scale trials that keeps the, that it keeps the SEMA levels low in the long term. Um, we also have proof that it shows that, that uh, it increases bee and honey production and reduces overwinter losses. Um, the, Hive Alive also, as I mentioned, prevents syrup from going bad. Um, and it, it both, it, 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 there's no problem with bees taking down the syrup with Hive Alive, which some products can have. They actually take it down quicker with Hive Alive. But also the other side of it, there isn't any robbing problems that it causes, uh, that, that, that nobody wants robbing where hives, hives can be destroyed. So a, a quick summary on the liquid then. So Hive Alive is using natural, edible, safe ingredients. So there's no worries about health issues, honey contamination, or employee safety. Uh, it's a very versatile product and there's proven data on it. So Hive Alive does have 
short term benefits, but they're not the main reason why beekeepers use hive alive. Um, personally, um, using short uh, short term data, anything that has a strong, really strong short term effect generally has a side effect uh, down down the road. Uh, hive life does have extremely impressive long term effects, uh, which improve year on year. And this has been proven. Uh, and like I said, it's unique in that it's the only feed supplement uh, with proven data to show long term um, uh, long term uh, results. It's also an excellent return on investment. Not only is it easy to use, but it, it, it's uh, it, it's it's excellent for for maintaining bee health, increasing productivity, uh, and keeping your keeping your colonies healthy. So nearly there. That's the hive alive liquid. Just quickly to introduce to you, some of you may know about this already, new products that we have in the Hive Alive lineup. So we have a Hive Alive fondant and we have a Hive Alive pollen protein patty. Um, so fondant, maybe not everyone knows fondant or how fondant's used. So, so fondant is used in the winter time for, um, for feeding bees in the winter time when it's it's too cold for sugar syrup to be fed because they can't evaporate the sugar syrup. Um, it's traditionally put on top of the, the, the cover board or just put underneath the cover board. And um, it, 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 it's there for the, put on top of the cluster. So it's there right next to the cluster so that, so that if the bees start to get hungry, it's there for them. Um, what can happen is you have a cluster of bees and, uh, they're eating all the, 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 the food in the comb around them. The cluster gets smaller and then they can be a bit, even a frame or two away from the food. And if it stays cold, the cluster is not going to move and they can easily starve. Uh, nothing more depressing than open the colony up in spring and finding uh, a cluster of bees with food right next to them, but they're, all the bees are dead or all their heads are stuck in the, in, in the comb where their arse is sticking out and they all die because they were they weren't able to leave the cluster, it was too cold to leave the cluster to get their food. And that's where the fauna really comes in useful that you can have it there sitting on top of the, of, of the, um, of, of the clusters so they can easily access the food and they won't starve. So our fondant has the correct dose of hive alive added to it. It has uh, uh, additional vitamins, amino acids added to it as well. Um, we make it using an enzymatic process, which is the best way to make fondant because it doesn't, uh, other ways of doing it basically can, can put high levels of HMF, which is toxic to bees in the product. Um, it comes in boxes of six or boxes of 15. We use a very fine particle sugar size, so it's easier for the bees to digest, if, uh, digest it. We've got natural active ingredients and it's, it's made in Europe with non-GMO ingredients, which is for some people is very important as well. But one of the, the real beauties of our product is, is the packaging that we have is quite thin. It's only yay, thick, less than an inch thick and um, it's thin and flat. So it's easy to put it directly on top of the colonies, either above and below the cover board. Um, so you can put the roof on with a problem. And if it's warm, if you get the pack a little bit warm, you can squeeze it in underneath the, the, the cover board as well. Um, and the way it works is, is where the label is, you cut a hole where the label is. Put it right over, over if you've got a hole in your cover board, put it right over that hole. It's going to be right above the cluster. Um, it, it's got clear packaging so you can see if they're taking it down, if they need more or not. But the real beauty of it is, is that the fondant won't dehydrate when it's in that packaging, just the circles open at the bottom of it. So that means that because you don't know when the bees are going to need to eat the food. So, um, you know, are they going to eat it in November? Or are they going to start running out of food in, in, in February? But it's there when they need it and it won't dry out. That's an important thing is the, is, is the fondant won't dry out if you, if you put it correctly on top of the, on top of the, the crown board or on top of the colony. Um, so the food is ready for the bees when they need it. Uh, and all you do then is lift up because they're clear packaging, you know, disturb the colony, you just lift up, see if the packaging has, uh, if, see through the packaging to see if they've eaten it all up and do they need more or not. Nice, uh, simple to use product. And very finally, um, just talk briefly about our pollen patty, um, protein patty. So this is real pollen. This is this is something we worked with global patties on. Uh, global patties are, are all the trials recently are showing that global patties come out top of every every trial when it comes to comparing protein patties. This patty has 15% real US pollen, total of over 15% protein. Um, it has all the benefits of Hive Alive add to. We add one teaspoon uh, per patty, so quite a high concentration of Hive Alive in there. 
uh, we have been told that uh, the, the, the protein patty is, is consumed extremely quickly. We've got a lot of people uh, down the south where there's small hive beetle who are loving this because they eat this much quicker than any ordinary uh, uh, pollen or, or protein patty. So they can eat it up before the, 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 the small hive beetle has a chance to start causing a problem. They, they don't put the whole thing on, I think they, they cut it up into bits. Uh, and we also have additional seaweed extracts added to uh, uh, micronutrients, so for extra nutritional value. So we believe we've made what Globe is best is the best pie in the market. We just made it. We just made it better. And uh, that that's it. That's that's my talk. Um, the question I have, if you want to email us uh, with you, with the answer, is what concentration should hive live be added to syrup? I can take metric or imperial. I don't mind. Uh, just email us uh, at info at hivelivebees.com and we will get back to you probably tomorrow because it's it's two in the morning for me. Well, it's nearly three in the morning for me now. Uh, I'm going to go to bed after this. Um, but when I wake up, we'll, we'll uh, have a look and, and there should be three prizes then for three different people. Um, and of course, if you have any other questions, um, please don't hesitate to uh, to ask us. We're always delighted to have questions. Um, and um, Questions about the talk or questions about how I've we're more than happy to, to, to talk to you about it. So um, thanks very much for, 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 for listening. Thanks very much for your time. And I hope uh, someone got, or you all got something out of it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, we do have a couple questions. I have a couple. Uh, thanks again for staying up uh, really late or early in the morning. No problem, no problem. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, it's from the Q&A. Uh, I guess the person says, hi there, I'm channeling my inner scientist. Do you have any published studies that were proactive, randomized, placebo controlled that showed the effect of Hive Alive? Yeah, with the, 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 they, were, they were all uh, randomized and uh, the placebo, or, well, the placebo was, I don't know if you call it placebo, but the control versus control, um, which is sort of standard procedure for, for doing any field trials, uh, and, and they're, they're published as well, so it's peer-reviewed and published. The, 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 the largest one, the first one I talked about is, is peer-reviewed and published, so yeah, they're, they're available online. Wonderful. I guess the, for myself, especially uh, with my long winters, and the on the B numbers in the spring. So you've done mortality tests. So to, um, to measure mortality of bees. So because it's not really, I guess my question is, is it brood production or is it reduced mortality in winter bees? Have you looked into that? Um, I think it's reduced mortality because I don't, if it was brood production, I mean, a lot of the overwinter losses are going to happen well into the in the middle of winter before brood starts becoming a factor in it. So I, I I haven't analyzed which it is, but my gut would be it's it's more on healthy bees versus brood production. Good. The brood production takes more time anyway. It's not like you you feed it straight away and you'll see it straight away. You know, it, it's you feed in the autumn, it's the brood production, then it, sort of the following season next summer is where you start seeing that change. So yeah, I, I believe it's more about healthy, uh, healthy bees. Okay, and I guess my second question was, I feed in the fall only, and then there's plenty of feed till pretty much the beginning of summer. It, it, does it, does the product degrade over time? So if it's stored in a honey frame, will it be active? Have you done aging studies on the, on the product? We We've done aging studies on the liquid, not with it in the comb, but I, I don't think it's going to deteriorate rapidly to the point that it's, it's, it, it, it might lose a little bit of efficacy, but nothing, nothing significant. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. So this other person I have used, Hive Alive, I got very good results. Do you know, the only problem that I saw, it has oil in it and it attracts bees very quick. And I see some bees dying in the feeder. Yeah, yeah, we, we've seen that before, particularly with the, the rapid feeders, um, the ones that have the cone in the middle and the, where they'll come up quickly into it. 
um, what, what, what we find is just putting in something like a bit of sawdust, uh, not sawdust, but like wood shavings or is it, uh, there's another th thing of, you can put a sock, like put a sock over the, the, the comb part uh, and that, that stops the problem uh, happening as well. But yeah, it's, it's, it's basically they, they, they push each other into the feeder uh, when, they're, when they're not going up to get it. Um, but yeah, it's easily, it's easily resolved. Good. Another one is my bees are consuming about a gallon every two, three days. Is there any concerns with feeding them too much high velocity? Too much? No. Uh, too high a concentration. So that 2.5 mil per litre. Oh, oh, I've given away this. Given away. <laughs> um, but that, that concentration, whatever, that, that, that concentration is. Um, is the optimal concentration too less? It won't work as well. It won't be strong enough. Too much now, like in places like Spain, they actually feed it. I think it's it's either three times the concentration. They feed it small amount of liquids at a much higher concentration because they don't feed a huge amount of syrup there. They'll still take that down. A concentration over that is too high, but what they just, they just won't touch it is what will end up happening. So so that's not a concern either. But um, no, there's, there's, and we recommend that, that all syrup fed would would have uh, the. The, the right concentration of hive alive attitude. That's the best way to use hive alive. Yeah. Okay. So this one here says, "Did I hear you say that your product can be used with honey supers on?" Nope. Don't say that. Um, so all the ingredients are grass ingredients. That's generally accepted as safe. They're all edible ingredients. But if you use it with, well, I mean, you shouldn't be feeding syrup with honey supers on full stop. But if uh, if you do use it, what it will do is it will flavor the honey. Well, sorry, you'd have to use an awful lot of it for flavor. I've never, we've never had an issue with someone saying, oh, my honey, I've all tastes of hive alive. But there is the potential of, of it, it flavoring hive alive. There is a smell of hive alive. So uh, I, I just wouldn't do it. So we, uh, we recommend taking, it's on, the, it's on the label, we recommend taking off or stop feeding two weeks before you add on any, so any supers. No, so typical, two weeks. Yeah, yeah. But any other questions? Yeah, hi, um, this is Ron uh, up in uh, Calgary in Canada. And I uh, appreciated your talk. I really have no experience whatsoever with your product. And uh, it seems to be interesting and, and probably has a lot of utility. And you've done, uh, it looks like about 10 years of uh, trials with it. I was a bit curious um, near the beginning, one of your questions, uh, one of your charts um, showed the, uh, the difference between the, uh, we'll call it a control hive and, and a colony that's being treated. I don't know how many colonies you did in your trials. Um, the error bars are pretty wide, so I, I assume it's a relatively small number of colonies that were in the initial stages of your testing. Um, but here's my question. In March 2014, I think it was, um, you showed that with Hive Alive, the uh, spore count for, for Nozema was all the way up to 5 million. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if, if, if you recommend that we supplement your supplement with uh, fumagillin or anything else? Um, yeah, sure. So, so the, 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 the trials, they, they had 20 colonies per group, just to, to clarify that. Um, people do ask us that quite a bit. Um, and I think that if you have very high levels of... Um, of spores uh, that you're really concerned about, um, yeah, maybe using fumagillin is the right thing to do in the short term. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not crazy about the idea of fumagillin, so like fumagillin is, is banned in Europe. It's uh, it causes blood platelet issues in humans and stuff like that. So it's it's banned actually pretty much most of the rest of the world, except for for North America. Um, and and there and like I know it does it can show good results, but it also can show that it stresses the bees out and stuff like that as well. And that's sort of the Oh, sort of short-term, you know, fix for, for you know short short-term gain, but maybe long-term not so good. Um, but yeah, and people have added Fumigil and Hive Alive at the same time. Now I, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I know they have, um, but yeah, if I had a very, if it was me, and if I was happy with using Fumigil and I had a very high level of semen that I was concerned about, I'd be using Fumigil as well because we're, we're, it, Hive Alive isn't really about a quick fix that way. So yeah, I'd use a Fumigil instead as well. Okay. Okay, appreciate that. That's that's a fair answer. Thank you. 
no problem. So I guess uh, there's another question. So about the ratio of syrup to hive alive, does it change for the concentration of the syrup? So for one to one syrup versus two to one syrup, do you recommend the same ratio? We don't. Uh, oh, sorry, we, we do recommend the same ratio. We, we we don't we don't change it. We just sort of kept it simpler. Like I said, there is a there is a range of what you can put in anyway. Um, and using the the lighter syrup um, uh, at the same concentration also going to up the concentration a little bit. And we know that that works fine because we have used, like I mentioned actually already, the, the, in Spain they use a much higher concentration and that works fine too as well. So we just to keep it simple, we just say the same concentration all the way through. Sounds good. Uh, this one here, it's a repeat. So can you repeat the correct placement of the fondant product on the, yeah. the colony? So on top of the frames or on top of the hole of the inner cover? It depends on what you have and what space you have. So so traditionally what it's done, you see, I, I, I think in the US, some of the, the cover boards don't have holes on the top of them, if I, if I, know, if I remember correctly. Um, so like like at home, what I'll do is is our, our our cover boards have a hole. So I'll just so you you get the package. It's easier to cut it on the label side because if you have the label side sitting up, it's hard to see if the bees are eating. So you put the label side down, cut the hole in the package, and put and put a bit of plastic out of the way and put that hole directly over the hole on on, on your cover board, uh, and that'll be right over the center of the cluster. And the bees then can go up in there and take it nice and easy. They're not they're not walking away two or three frames away to try and get food, so they're not going to starve. Um, if you don't have a um, hole on your on your cover board, what you can do is you can squeeze it uh, directly on top of the frames. So you can put it on top of the frames and then put the cover board on top of it again. Um, the easiest way to do that is to try and warm up the fondant. Maybe have it um, near a radiator or just have it somewhere warm before you put it, bring it bring it out, so it's more malleable and easier to, to press down. So you can squeeze it, uh, sort of sort of press down a little bit into the frame, so it's able to be a small enough space that it can fit directly underneath the crown board without a sort of crown board sitting proud and not making a seal on on the on, your, on the top of your colony. And I guess the fondants are. 2.2 pounds or a kilogram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, she said, she said that. Yeah, one kilogram, 2.2 pounds, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? And I guess uh, I was going to ask the Nosima question, but I'll save that for Martin. I, I do want, if you don't mind, I do, do want to ask a, a question that's, um, as I say, I've never tried your product, but you got me intrigued and I'm, I'm going to give it a shot here and, and I only have a a few colonies in the backyard, but, but I'm definitely interested in trying it out. Um, but I, want, I have a question that's not directly related to the product itself, but more in the experimentation. And that was that if I, if I read the graphs correctly, it looked like the maximum population that you had in a treated colony um, or colonies was about 15,000 bees. Um, and then uh, roughly, I can't remember the number, but 89% of that or, 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 or fewer in the, um, in, in the, in the non-treated colony. Um, I, th I think I, I know what most most people here in North America are probably thinking. Um, is that a nuke or like like what were you like a fifteen thousand colony hive would probably be a dead out here? Um, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. We, we we we've we've had a, uh, our critics on that as well. It's just the way it worked out. So the, these trials are run in Greece, and the colonies run smaller in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in advance, what what happened was is they had two really really bad winters. Um, the, 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 they, they got a lot of snow in Greece where normally they wouldn't get snow at all. So the colonies didn't ever really build up uh, uh, properly um, the way they should have, I suppose. Uh, and um, yeah, so the colonies are, are small for sure. Um, even by Irish standards, they're small. Um, but I think the data still remains true though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fair enough, but thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and I guess for, okay, one more question. So for 10 frames of bees, how much of your pollen patty do you recommend in the South where they have high beetle issues? Uh, I don't know. What, what, I, what I do know is what we've been told is that they, they cut it up into smaller bits, like into halves or thirds and put it and squash it really, really flat uh, give, uh, and, uh, uh, and put it on and then just, just keep an eye. And once that's gone, they'll put another one on. Um, there are also people are also be telling us that if you put it on top of a queen excluder or yeah, yeah queen excluder, that that it gives less space for the the um, 
the hive beetles to hide underneath the, the patty uh, and that can make it easier again or, or easier for the bees to, to, to maintain lower levels of the of the ultimate to, to fight off the, the small hive beetle a bit better. Sounds great. Again, thank you very much. Our pleasure. It, pleasure. it was very really, appreciated. Uh, can, can I make you a short question? Uh, sure. Is, just uh, do, do you have any result about uh, the effect of Hyralab in 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 Ascosfera apis, the fungus? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was showing that earlier in the in the petri dish. Yeah. So so basically, I mean, it was what happened there is is. We, we never really anticipated it would work on the foul brood or the chalk brood, but um, um, beekeepers told us that when they use hive light, they just don't get chalk brood. Chalk brood is probably more common, common in Ireland than it is maybe in North America because in Ireland it's so damp and, and the weather fluctuates a lot and it's windy, so it's, the bees are a bit more, it's a bit harder on them. Um, and we have a lot of we had a lot of people telling us that we don't that they don't get chalk brood when they when they feed with hive life. So that's what we did the the, the, the in vitro tests, uh, and yeah, in the vitro tests does not grow at all uh, when when there is um, hive life added to it. It was really surprising for me uh, the, the quantity of chalk brood in in Ireland. <laughs> okay, the, yeah, the, the hives are still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think it's also the strain as well that the the, the Apis mellifera mellifera. But but you probably. You know, saw it like is 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 uh, is the uh, Martin was doing a study coincidentally in Ireland uh, this 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 summer and uh, and um, um, down in the south of our south of the country and um, the the way the weather changes and it can go like in the middle of summer it could be off it was a pretty it was a good summer actually but it can go just miserable for a week where it's cold and rainy and wet. <laughs> yes, yes, pretty good, good nice summer. It sounds like the Yukon. Uh, I guess two new questions, but they, they're fairly short. So one is shelf life of the liquid and how can you extend the shelf life, refrigeration, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so the shelf life from data manufacture is about, is, is three years. Um, uh, and to be honest, that's probably conservative. The, the product doesn't really go off, um, but we, 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 we say th I'm not guaranteeing it after three years, but that's just my personal opinion on it or whatever um, and how to extend the shelf life uh, I wouldn't put it in the fridge what if you put it in the fridge you can get some separation certainly if you put it in the fridge uh, and you take it out again make sure you give it a really good shake give a shake anyway before you use it but give it a really good shake if you have it in the fridge just keep it cool uh, you know not not hot um, somewhere in a cool place and it, it'll be fine good and I guess I promised the last question uh, have you looked at the effects of Hive Alive and Varroa, if there's any interaction there? Not properly. Like, I, I, I know that there is a bit of a Varroa drop uh, if you spray it. Um, not enough for it to be a Varroa treatment in any way, shape, or form, but it does help. And, and, and a lot of beekeepers will spray it, you know, once a week for three weeks in the springtime when there's a lot of just mainly phoretic mites. Uh, and that does help knock some numbers down, um, which obviously helps then long term in, in the year if you're starting off with lower numbers. Um, I'd love to do a study to see if it has some sort of long-term effect that that, that, that is, does it make the, the larvae less attractive or something like that? Does it have it? But I, ha I haven't done it yet. No, and I, I'm kind of intrigued now to, to, to look at it, but I just haven't had the time to get around to set okay. one up. And I guess if there are any scientists or beekeepers interested in participating in a trial, uh, yeah. is it something they could reach out to you about? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We always want to do trials in Hive Alive. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So I'll wish you a good night and sweet dreams. I'm going to hang on. I want to hear Martin anyway. I'll hang on for okay. a moment. I'm buzzed now, so I need to, <laughs> need to wind down. So, so, so yeah, I, I want to hear what Martin has to say. So, yeah. Thank you. Sounds Thank you good. Thank you. So, Martin, I'll uh, make you co-host just to make sure you can share the presentation. Okay, I will try to share. Okay, please tell me if you see the slides. It's all good. Excellent. So thank you very much, Etienne, for your presentation and, and for the invitation. 
Um, I am really, really glad. Also, I want to thank uh, Dara um, because he also invited to me. I was suggested by him. Um, it's uh, my first time uh, for, for, for this kind of, of presentations in the United States, so sorry because of my English. Uh, but if, I, if you don't get something, please uh, ask me and I will try to, to answer. Um, okay, I, uh, I work in Argentina as a researcher at the Scientific and Technical Research Council uh, and in the National University of Mar del Plata. Mar del Plata is a coastal city, it's in the Buenos Aires province. Mm, we have a beautiful city um, if you want to come. Um, and in there, there is our research center. Uh, just, just to have some um, some some uh, perspective. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Just 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 to compare the the size of of, of the of, of of the regions. Our province, Buenos Aires, is almost like New Mexico, uh, and in there, in the center of Argentina, uh, the 50, 55 percent of peak, of beekeepers are uh, developing the, the activities. So in there is the most productive uh, place in, in Argentina. Uh, our research center, Social Bee Research Center, uh, is working from 1988. And in there, nowadays, there are more than 30 researchers and PhD students. Our activities involve uh, scientific dissemination, technical assistance, uh, transference, teaching, uh, of course, um, exchange and, and collaboration at international level and involvement with community. Um, in, in this uh, center, the main topics uh, are most, mostly related to sanitary, ecological and productive aspects of honeybees, uh, but also native bees. We have many native species and we try to understand how they interact with the environment <clears throat> and uh, with the honeybees that is uh, keeping is, is, a, is a huge activity in Argentina and the beekeepers uh, are, are, are producing honey uh, uh, mainly for exportation. Okay, um, although in our country the support for science has not been constant, uh, the group has grown continuously because despite of the fact that some research lines are sometimes cut off by the budget, such you can see uh, the Hydra in Greek mythology, uh, our group creates two new ones each time uh, to, in order to continue moving forward. Each, each time that one is, 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 is cut, <laughs> two new arise. Uh, so I started my work in osmosis. Um, this research line uh, is running from 2004. And, and at that time I was a collaborating student uh, and I did my PhD and postdoc focusing on the epidemiology and on trying to, to obtain and, and test non-contaminant substances uh, as alternative to nosema to control nosema disease, um, but also studying sublethal effects of this parasite on honeybees. Nowadays, the the main topics of, of research in, in in this line uh, are those related with distribution and epidemiology of the parasite, uh, trying to understand the dynamic along the year. And uh, okay, uh, we are still looking for uh, non-contaminant treatments for the con for to control this this parasite, um, and we are also trying to detect uh, diseases in native bees and the interactions uh, between this parasite and, and nutrition behavior and communication uh, between bees. Okay. Um, there is a, an old tango song uh, that 
says that 20 years is nothing, but uh, if we think about Nosima and this parasite that has become uh, uh, very close to, to, to Apis mellifera bees uh, almost 20 years ago, um, let's, let's try to, to, to see, to briefly review some important concepts on nosemosis. Uh, okay, this parasite is commonly underestimated uh, and there are reasons for that. Uh, so I will try to comment briefly uh, some, 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 concepts, some concepts that maybe you know, but uh, it, is, it, it is not bad to, to, to go back again to them. Uh, so let's start for some details on the biology of this parasite. Um, those parasites are microsporidia. Microsporidia is a, is a really, really big group of parasites. Uh, many, many of them uh, are um, closely associated with uh, species of insects and vertebrates. And there is a complex um, taxonomic classification. Um, they, are, they are pretty simple, but they are simple uh, not because uh, they, they, uh, they were in that way always. They evolved to be simple. And that's interesting because those fungus, they are, they are, um, they are grouped like fungus. They are highly, highly adapted, adapted to parasitism. So they have just what they need to parasite. Uh, the parasite, this microsporidia generate um, resistant spores. Those are really, really resistant and small. So you can see that they are smaller than, uh, than a pollen grain. And these resistant structures um, contain what I say before, uh, just the things they need to uh, transmit the, the genetic material into, um, into the, the, the tissue that, that will be uh, able to, to, to receive this material and the parasite will take that cell uh, to, to generate more resistant spores. So it's pretty simple, but uh, this simplicity uh, is also coupled with uh, this capacity of dispersate uh, almost everywhere and resist a lot of conditions, environmental conditions. So uh, if we go to the classification, we have two species, Nosima apis and Nosima serrani, uh, that they were histo historically associated with, Nos with apis mellifera and apis serrana. There is a new species, Nosema pneumani. This species has been reported a few years ago but uh, still there is no information about the distribution uh, out of Africa. So let's keep with Nosema apis and Nosema serrani. Those species were reported as uh, parasites, as natural parasites of Apis mellifera and Apis serrana um, almost 100 years ago, more, more than 100 years, years ago for Nosema apis. And, in the, in the 90s for Nosema serrani. And uh, the, the, the researchers tried to understand if these parasites can be crossed, can, can share host uh, under laboratory conditions. So these tests were performed in the 90s and they realized uh, that these parasites were able to infect uh, the cross species, the cross host. So the surprise came when they found Nosima serrani in Apis mellifera as a natural parasite. It was in the, in the 2005 and six, and it was a kind of revolution, I could say. Why a late surprise? Because uh, they found it in 2005, 2006, but uh, all the samples showed that the parasite, it was present many, many years ago. And this is not the first time that happens something like this because 
uh, you know, uh, with varroa happens almost the same. There were two waves of, of infection, uh, the Japanese one and the Korean one. And in, in there, there was uh, a, a really, um, that, 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 that was a, 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 real, um, a real change for the keeping. And, and that, at that point, uh, with these waves of, of varroa infection, uh, it seems that came Nosema Serrani with them. So, what, which differences exist between Nosema Serrani and Nosema Apis? Uh, briefly, the spores are different. So you cannot differentiate the spores of one or the other species uh, by light microscopy. You have to use um, molecular techniques uh, because of the genome is different. Um, so you have primers or, or pieces of, of, of the genome that are different. So the primers can uh, attach to them and you can recognize in that way. Um, then, you have differential uh, ability to adapt to temperature. That's something interesting and maybe is modulating the dispersion of these parasites through the world. Uh, there are some differences in the distribution areas, uh, maybe because of this adaptation to temperature. And there are some diverse pathological effects in field. That's the most difficult to identify, but let's, let's see. Uh, we have two kinds of nosomosis. So one caused by nosomapis and the other one caused by nosomacerani. So we have type A and type C. And you can see that differences are pretty, uh, so are not, sorry, there are not many differences between, between them. Uh, something typical that you can commonly find uh, is this um, association with uh, feces in the entrance or inside the hive? That uh, the, the, this, this kind of symptom was associated to Nosomatis, but not to Nosoma Um And we will see that there are some differences, but the, those differences are, are really difficult to, to, to find uh, just. Uh, with, with your eyes without, without any analysis. So the question who arises from this uh, exchange of parasites or jump of this parasite from, so from Apicirana to Apis mellifera is if, the, if there was a substitution or displacement of one nosimosis by the other. And studies propose that it seems like no. So uh, they are, the, the two parasites are um, like, are, are living together, but in the, there are, there are characteristics, characteristics of Nosema serrani that make it, make this, this species more easy to spread uh, in, in different climates. So what's the impact of the increased distribution of Nosema serrani? Uh, okay, there was uh, an important change in seasonality and virulence. You can see in this graph how uh, from 1999 to, uh, to 2005, the percentage of infected hives in, 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 in an apiary uh, is changing along the years and the stationality is lost, is lost uh, because the peaks of infection or, or percentage or proportion, proportion of infected hives that uh, you can find uh, during the first years uh, and just in, in autumn and winter, it, it is changing. And then uh, you find a scenario where you can, you can have uh, almost uh, hide almost uh, infected almost the whole year. So this is a really important change with the appearance of Nosema Serrani. And what is the...
typical basis of this substitution. Okay, um, a better, a better, better thermic tolerance for nosema serrani. That seems to be the reason why this nosema serrani is not only more virulent, but also uh, is mm, widely distributed and, and, and invade some spaces uh, that where, where nosema no is, is not present. But this invasion is also uh, extended along the ear. Okay, yes, this parasite is spread everywhere. Uh, nosema serrani you can find uh, in every continent. And in Argentina, we have made a deep study on different uh, provinces. And uh, no matter what climate or, or, or what size of operation you have, uh, nosema serrani is present along the territory uh, the whole year. So it's, uh, we have to think about the parasite that causes a pressure during the whole year in, in the hives. Okay, uh, how, why this parasite spread so easily? Uh, we talk about the resistance of these spores. Those are really, really resist, uh, resistant and um, they can be uh, still viable in royal jelly, honey and pollen for more than one year. And uh, of course, in, they, they are, they are Passes through to the bees uh, by trophallaxis uh, when the and, and when the phases are, are consumed uh, during cleaning activities. Uh, of course, the insectivorous predators uh, has an important role in in the in the distribution of spores. Uh, most of uh, also the, the insectivorous predators are are really important most. Uh, uh, most of all, if they are um, like like this bird flying from Africa to Spain uh, and, and emigrate, uh, and, and, and they they have found that the Agropilas, uh, that is this kind of residues of of, uh, of cuticula cuticle from the insects, uh, they still have inside. Uh, viable spores of nosema serrani. Um, okay, nosema is spread uh, also in in bombus, um, in bumblebees, uh, and the transmission during insemination is possible. So that's another way in which the spores spread almost everywhere. Uh, we have found um, spores and genetic material. Uh, of, of this nosema serrani parasite in, in Aetina tumida. And we have found also that Maria and Critidia bombi <clears throat> and some viruses. So this new fellow is uh, transmitting a lot of diseases maybe between colonies. Uh, and then we have um, in the north of Argentina and in, so from, from there to Brazil and Mexico and Central, Central America, uh, there are many native stingless bees species. And we have found in some countries that uh, some of those species uh, can be uh, at least, they, they, they are in contact with Nosema serrani because we have found uh, by means of molecular analysis uh, we have found Osima Sirani in there. So uh, the, the, these stingless bees are not the only bees affected. You can see here that domesticated or wild bees can be also affected by Nosema apis, Nosema bombi, and Nosema serrani. So we have a parasite that is spreading everywhere um, with no limits of species. Uh, we will try to um, to highlight some effects at individual level. Um, at first, uh, well, we have to know that the two castes, so the, the queen and the throne, but also the, the of course, the, the worker are affected. 
and there are some reports about uh, about finding of uh, genetic material from Nausima serrane in pupae and drawn pupae. Uh, that doesn't mean that the parasite is affecting this um, uh, this this stage, but it's still interesting to know that. Um, okay. The tissue that is affected is the midgut. And we will see now that the midgut, midgut is really, really important for the bee. Uh, you can see it now in a, in a picture. Um, and okay, here is the graph that Dara showed before. Um, the, the important thing about nosema uh, and the effect on the individual bee uh, is that this parasite is using the tissue, the B tissue, the midgut tissue, to produce as, as, as a factory to produce more spores. So uh, once that the spore penetrates with the polar filament, the cell in the in the gut uh, of, of the honeybee, uh, this genetic material uh, uses the the machinery of the cell to reproduce himself so in in a, in a few hours you will find new uh, new mature spores that not only can be released into the light of the midgut but also they can infect the uh, neighbor cells so the same spore that was uh, developed inside this cell can uh, eject the polar filament again and uh, penetrate the, the, the neighbor cell and start an infection in there. So it's enough one spore uh, to initiate uh, this, uh, this, this reproduction that uh, became really, really uh, um, exponential and, and generates a million of spores in one week. So you can see here the estimated quantity of spore needed is almost two spores, so almost nothing. Uh, and the time uh, that is needed for this intracellular infection that is one of the of the of the main impacts on on, on the honeybee. Uh, is really fast. Uh, so the idea that we have to, to, that we need to have in mind when we think about nosema is the idea that this parasite is destroying the tissue that the bee needs to um, digest, but also to absorb the nutrients. So we have this midgut that is really, really important and is acting uh, as a kind of gut, but also like a stomach. Uh, so um, in, at, at this point, when, when the parasite has spread along the, the tissue, uh, of course, this function of the midgut is lost. Uh, we can see here two cuts, and in there you can see uh, how uh, the, the cells that in a, in a non-infected or healthy bee uh, is working and is irrigated and the cells, the, sorry, the, the nucleus of the cells are uh, conspicuous and, 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 and the cell is working well. Uh, also the peritrophic membrane is present uh, and protecting the tissue uh, from the abrasion of, of pollen and, and, and you can see that all of that is lost when the parasite, these small points that you can see here, really, really small, uh, have take the cells and now these cells are not working anymore like, like uh, for, for digestion or, or absorption. Uh, so they are just machinery for the parasite. To generate new parasites. Um, okay, uh, but the problem that no similar generates is not just a digestive problem. Why? Because this 
uh, lack of nutrition or, or, or the proper nutrition became so causes problems different than nutrition problems. Why? You can find in an infected bee, you can find you can find effects uh, on the immune response, on the production of pheromones and the communication affecting the communication between uh, between them. Uh, so dissociation of social and individual hunger. This is important because the bee uh, doesn't follow what the hive needs, but what he, uh, what she needs she needs at, at that moment. Um, they make premature and risky foraging, and uh, there are of course synergism with pesticides and pesticides and some viruses, um, and there is a loss of lipids among other effects. But the more important effects are, at first, the advancement or changes in the physiological age, because a bee uh, that maybe is an RSV bee and is not ready to uh, to, to to fly and forage uh, goes out and do that because uh, the alteration in the physiology causes uh, this uh, like disequilibrium between the vitellogenin and the uh, and, and the young hormone and because of that disequilibrium the bee is making uh, making task that is not uh, ready to do. Um, then you, the bees have uh, atrophiated the hypopharyngeal gland, so they cannot feed the the new the new larvae. Uh, but the worst of all is the increase in the metabolic demand because this hunger or um, or energetic stress uh, is is impacting directly in how much uh, energetic demand uh, the bee have. Uh, so this metabolic demand will cost not only to the bee, but also to the hive. And then you have a, a death of this bee as a consequence of the malnutrition, but also because of the physiological and behavioral alterations. So the bee, most of the time, do not die because of nosema, but yes, because of the consequences of nosema uh, and the interaction with the, with an stressful environment. Um, these uh, effects uh, also are varying during the ontogeny. So it's not the same effect of the parasite in a young bee or in an older bee. And this is important because of this um, physio uh, physiological management uh, tasks. So the, the age and the activities that the bee is performing um, can be affected uh, if the parasite was present from the beginning of the life of the bee or after uh, she was, she started for Asia. Um, so commonly the parasite um, gets into the bee when she's really, really young, and during the, the short life of, of the bee, uh, the parasite will be reproducing and generating more spores. And if a young bee get infected, uh, is is possible that uh, at, at the at the at the late at, at the uh, and after when when she's uh, uh, reaching the end of, of of the life, uh, the effects are really, really um, strong. Um, okay, so at, we have talked about uh, individual level, but what happens at colony level? Okay, this is a possible explanation <clears throat> for an announced death. So uh, it's a way in, uh, in which we can understand uh, why the colony is dying. Uh, because of nosema. Uh, this is, of course, theoretical, but uh, can has has uh, um, sense in in many ways uh, and describes very well what happens sometimes in in the late winter and the 
and the early spring. Uh, okay, the colonies and microenvironment uh, that cover transmission opportunities. And okay, a pathogen can be lethal at individual level, as we saw, uh, but this can be compensated by the mechanism of the colony. Um, the problem is that no CMI is causing this effect changing the equilibrium of the age structure because there is a continuous die, uh, dying of worker bees uh, that do not come back to the hive. Um, this, the, progress, the progression of the disease can be uh, like equilibrated by the queen and nurses, but this happens until some point because uh, the transition from the nurse B to for HPs is accelerated. So there, there are no not not only bees dying outside because of no sigma, uh, but also many of them are flying out the hive before they are ready to do it. Um, and the energetic stress, as, as we said, caused by this hunger, um, is making the bees uh, choosing a risky foraging. So they will go uh, to look for a reward to places that maybe without the, the, the infection they want. Um, there is interaction with Varroa, of course, because Varroa is causing a similar effect on, on the foraging, on, on the forager bees, because they do not come back when they are infested. And Okay, they do not return. So when when they are uh, heavily infected, uh, is is really really uh, there are low probabilities uh, for the bee to return to the pollen. And okay, this sometimes could be interpreted as an adaptive behavior or sacrifice. Um, this is uh, a proposal, but um, that has sense. But anyway, if this is true or not, uh, the, the, the truth is that the bee do not come back. And, and this, is, this, is, this is really evident because uh, this, the, the signs of colony weakness are not evident. Uh, you, you can see that the, there are bees dying outside, the queen and the, and the nurse bees are trying to compensate that. Um, if the environment um, allows that, uh, the, the, the colony will not die, but uh, this has a limit, of course. Um, this long asymptomatic period of absence, uh, with, with absence of, of obvious signs, um, is like the, the, previous, uh, the, the previous stage uh, before the death of the colony. Um, so we have a long inc incubation period, a continuous death of Horatio bees, a continuous brood breeding, because the queen and, and the nurse bees continues trying to, to compensate the loss. And then the colony losses in winter or early spring, uh, you can see uh, you can see them die, but you, you see them when they are already depopulated, um, even when they still have some pollen and honey. So, and why some hives die and some of them not? Uh, and how deep is this impact? Uh, which forces are interacting at, the, at this point? The, uh, so, uh, what, what, what happens? Uh, what, what, uh, which forces are, are, are uh, like uh, moving the equilibrium to the to death? Uh, so we talk about uh, at this point we talk about the predisposing factors. And those are another factors different from the presence of nosema. So you can have nosema, you you have the host and you have the environment, but then you have predisposing factors that can help or expose the the host to a problem. And which are those predisposing factors or the main ones at least? Uh, okay, 
the state of the queen and workers, so the age of the queen, the quantity of worker or nurse bees, uh, of course, the climate, and the resources that offer the environment or the resources that are stored in the hive. Um, for example, bee management practices, uh, that's uh, uh, an, an, a predisposing factor because uh, if you don't manage the, um, the position of the hive, the inner space, the humidity or the temperature, uh, you, can, you can force the equilibrium in, into the, the side of the death of the hive. Uh, of course, the food availability, the pollen, the nectar, but also the water is very, very important and sometimes it's not taken account. Um, of course, there are climate factors, we all know about them. And the pesticide residues in the hive or, ma or hive matrices um, coupled with the imbalance in the colony population. So all of them are situations that may turn the equilibrium uh, into the wrong side. Uh, so this is the population. This is something that we also found uh, in the late winter or in the beginning of the spring, these empty uh, hives, uh, not, of course, not all of the hives are like this. In, I don't know, in uh, 30 hives apiary, you can find five or six uh, in this condition. So it's not caused by, by pesticides. And you can see uh, a, a fast depopulation. Uh, you know that because of the brood that is abandoned. Uh, and you can find this a small group of alive bees, almost alive. Uh, they are suffering cold in, in, our, in our place, in, in our province. There, there is still cold in the beginning of the spring. And you will see in this group the queen is still alive. And this bees surrounding the, surrounding the, the queen uh, are commonly not infected by nosema. So this is the end of the hive because of nosema coupled with um, nutritional, environmental, uh, another kind of problems. So nosema is not killing by, by itself the hive, but uh, of course is a, a pressure, a constant, a constant pressure that uh, sometimes derivate in this, in a short period. So this high, uh, 16, 17 days uh, before this, it was fine. It was with uh, five, four to five frames uh, covered with bees, but in two or almost three weeks uh, became like this. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And what is the relationship with the CCD, with the colony collapse disorder? Okay, you know much more than me about it, uh, but um, at scientific research level, uh, there were colony collapse in, in colonies that, uh, that had no SEMA, but also in some of them without Nosema. So uh, this relationship can be questionable. However, there is a strong research in some parts of the world, most, most of them in Spain, uh, that, uh, that directly correlates the nosemosis with this kind of depopulation syndrome. Okay, what are the difficulties about uh, the diagnosis? Uh, I, I know that uh, for, for, for beekeepers, also for me, I am also a beekeeper, uh, it's difficult to go to the field, take samples, uh, send the samples to analyze or analyze yourself the samples, wait for the results and try to uh, understand what happened in, in, in our hives. Uh, at the same time that we are trying to produce honey and, and solve problems. So uh, one of the difficulties of nosema is that is, uh, this looks like a ghost disease. Why ghost disease? Because you cannot see the disease until you don't look for it. So 
you will, uh, this is not an invisible disease. You can see it, but you need the right tools to, to deal with, with this disease. So uh, even if you have the right tools, you need to follow some steps um, that we will see later. Uh, the problem is that the symptomatology at colony level is really, really in a specific. Uh, you don't have a specific symptoms, and the bees, you won't find them with evident clinical signs. So you can find weak bees, unable to fly or trembling in the entrance or near the front of the colony. That's typical, but it's not uh, only related to, to nosema. Uh, you can find weak bees because many other 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 factors. Uh, it is frequent uh, queen supersedure uh, and the alteration in the dynamics of brood production. So sometimes if, if you open the hive um, during 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 flight hours, so I don't know after midday you open the hive without smoke and you see inside uh, that there is not enough uh, bees covering the open brood. Uh, you can see in there some problems in the quantity of, of bees or the relationship between nurses and foragers. Um, you can see a reduction of honey and pollen reserves. Uh, that happens many times with no semi infected hives, but not all the time. Um, because you can find uh, a huge quantity of stores in the hives, but uh, anyway, high spore counts. Um, okay, little fly activity. Uh, flight activity is something that denotes the, the quantity of operations. And this is evident when, when, when you have um, no SEMA that there is a reduced activity. But you have to. You need to have the the, the eye to to get that. Uh, the faces faces in the frames, or uh, this is rare, rare and, and mostly associated because associated to nosema apis. You cannot see this commonly for nosema serrane. Uh, the population and late development in the spring. So all of them are really really uh, and specific symptoms. And how you estimate the nosemosis in the apiary? Okay. You need to monitor uh, the foration bees returning from flight. It's easy to get them because you close the entrance and they will uh, they, they they will group all together in the entrance and it's easy to take. Um, they are the bees with the higher amount of force, more than younger, of course, and the the hind good is empty, so you won't uh, overestimate the quantity of spores present uh, and is an interesting number that is interesting, but you still need to make a good conservation and identification of the samples. Of course, you need to standardize the process, the process to analyze them. Uh, most of the time, uh, this is performed in the lab uh, that, that were using the samples, but sometimes the keepers make their own counts. And of course, you have to be really, really uh, accurate uh, when you count in the new hour chamber because one spore means in the conversion 10,000 spores. So it's really, really important that you know what you are doing when you count with this, uh, with this uh, technique. It's not the only one, but it's the most extended. Um, okay. And then you have the counts. You did the sampling, uh, but that's that's not all because uh, you will have just a photograph of how many spores or which percentage of bees are infected, but you need to compare that number or those numbers with something that you know, like a population curve. So you need to have something to compare and this is the most difficult thing because uh, you can say that you have 5,000, uh, sorry, uh, 5 million, uh, 500 or, or 5,000 spores, but uh, if you don't know which is the maximum in, at your place and what, what's the impact of 
this count uh, in, in, in your hives uh, is, is like nothing. So this is the technical work, the most important technical work uh, that is at first prepare an, an annual sporulation curve to know uh, what, what maximum, which maximum or minimum and which consequences they will have on your hives, in your research, in your in your production place. Uh, so once you know that you have the um, a positive sample, uh, you have preventive measures to apply. We know all of them because you have to ensure the a good a, a, a good queen. You have to ensure a good population. Of course, an adequate pollen intake, um, a nice place to put the hives uh, without humidity, without cold. Avoid the, um, the stress, of course. Not not to check too much. Manage the manage the, the space inside the hive, and um, of course minimize the number of squashed bees in revisions. And uh, you need to 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 change the water resources. So all of them are measures that you have to perform, not only for Nosima serrani or Nosima apis, uh, but also for the management of, 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 the, of, of the hives for, for every disease. And then you have some palliative measures. Uh, those measures uh, include the replacement of the, of the, of the old Combs uh, of the dirty combs, uh, cleaning and disinfection of the material. Um, of course, replace queens in case you need it. And all of those measures are focused on minimize or reduce the, the spores uh, around the, the hive or inside the hive. Uh, that's, that's the only way you can you can minimize the, 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 this parasite in, in, your, in your hive environment, uh, cleaning and, and trying to, to, to replace the, the, the dirty or the old material. And then you have, of course, pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy, uh, I won't talk about uh, fumagilin. Fumagilin is uh, like the, the, the most extended uh, antibiotic to, to control nosema. Um, I will comment just uh, some about some substances we have been studying and we are now studying, and many of them based on essential oils and main components, botanical extracts, uh, some commercial substances, uh, we have tried many of them. Uh, some are really promissory, but many, many of them uh, do not work under laboratory test uh, for, for no similar control. Uh, but it's interesting because it takes a lot of work to understand um, how a substance can be harmful or helpful for a bee. Uh, and maybe you can control the parasite or, or, or have some good impact on survival, but then you have effects on the communication or on the, uh, uh, on the physiological, um, on some important physiological uh, pathways in the, in the, in the bee. Uh, so it's difficult to find the perfect uh, treatment. Um, nowadays we are, participating of a research project uh, with uh, Italy, uh, Ireland, and Malta. Uh, and here you can see uh, data. So we are in, in this picture, we are in Italy uh, applying, administering some treatments to, to hives in there. And this, this, this project focus on, the, on using probiotics to, to control nosema and try to, to, um, to find uh, maybe some useful um, effects on uh, honeybee physiology more than controlling diseases. Or the idea is to find both of them, but 
uh, we are trying to understand how these probiotics and, and substances like Hyvalai are interacting with the bee under different diets, uh, different conditions, and in laboratory and field. So it's an interesting project that I think we'll, we will have uh, nice results to show in, in a short time. Uh, okay, and we perform also studies in vitro. So we are also testing how some substances are altering or uh, inhibiting the, the spore, the nosema spores. Um, okay, and then to finish, I have uh, I, I want to show you some results about nosema and bee nutrition at first, and then we will see something about uh, some experience about uh, nosema and queen replacement. Uh, why this is important? Because when we try to fight against a parasite, uh, we don't have to put the the, the, the focus just in killing the parasite, but it's really important to understand how this parasite is biologically interacting with the with our host, in this case the bee. So this I will show you three experiences related with nutrition. The first one is under laboratory conditions. Uh, the second one is in field, but uh, it's a semi-field approach because we market bees and recover them. Uh, so we know exactly the age of those bees. And the third one is uh, from colleagues from Uruguay, and they perform some assays at field. Uh, really interesting that complement the results we, I will show you first. So the first assay, please don't, don't, don't get loose with the numbers. Uh, it is important that you can see that uh, there are three diet treatments. Uh, one is just syrup, corn syrup. The other one is corn syrup uh, and, and a liquid protein. And the third one is the same syrup, but coupled with pollen, with uh, bee bread. So we gave this diet to three groups of bees, and then we uh, split them in other four groups, uh, infected with different, different quantities of spores. So these young bees, these groups of young bees, uh, were kept under laboratory conditions for two weeks. They were, of course, individually infected with the spores, and then they will keep under laboratory conditions. And what we found uh, shortly, we found that um, the, the, the quality of the diet, um, we thought at first that the quality of the diet, so the best diet is with pollen, uh, we will find with this diet lower quantities of spores, of course, because if you think that a good nutrition correlates with a good health um, is um, like you 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 can you can uh, you you can uh, hypothesize hypothesize uh, about that um, but in this case the the pollen gave not only uh, nutrition to the bee but also to the parasite so you can see that along the days, the parasite developed really quickly compared with the other diets, but also keep the bee alive for more time. So you can see that the pollen, not only so this good quality of diet, not only increases the spore load, but also increases the survival of the bee. Um, in the second experience, our hypothesis it was that this uh, liquid protein um, do not increase the spore load in nosema serrani, of nosema serrani in bees, uh, but also increase the survival and the betelogenin of the bee in field conditions. And what we did to try this, okay, we administered two diets, syrup and syrup, and syrup plus uh, liquid protein, and we gave that diet to four groups 
of, of bees, uh, infected ones and non-infected ones. So we infected them, uh, we marked them and released into the hives. And then after, after two times, two different uh, at eight or and 12 days after release, after infection, uh, we pick them and we analyze different uh, variables like uh, spores development and proteins. And we found that this liquid protein increases the spore load, even uh, given under field conditions. Uh, so um, not only the spore load was increased, but also the survival, like in the case of the laboratory of the laboratory test with pollen. Um, this increase is this increased concentration of total proteins also was correlated with an increase in vitellogenin. Um, I don't want to talk uh, much about vitellogenin, but this protein is really important for the physiology of the bee. Uh, so we found again that a better diet or an improved diet um, is causing the increase of the parasite. But what happens at field level, and this is why I wanted to show you this, this last experiment, um, because in this assay, uh, these fellows from Uruguay, they fed the hives with polyflora pollen, um, in, um, in, in uh, and, and, and some of them, sorry, I, I am trying to move the, okay. Okay, and you can see that there were two groups of hives, of 30, 31 and 31 hives, uh, one group received the polyfloral pollen and the other one received nothing. And they were, um, they were placed in a eucalyptus grandis uh, plantation. So you know that eucalyptus has not uh, a very good pollen. So the comparison was between um, hives without supplementation uh, exposed or feed just with the eucalyptus pollen against the group of hives uh, exposed or feed naturally with this eucalyptus pollen, but also including these patties or pies with uh, made with um, bee bread. So they followed these hives, the hives were moved to another place and they passed the winter and in the spring, they tested, or they tested, they tested along, along this time, how was the evolution of the spores, uh, of spore production of Nausima serrani. And they found this. They found that in the short term, the colonies under nutritional stress, consuming eucalyptus, showed a higher level of Nausima infection uh, but also a smaller population compared with the polyfloral pollen diet. So um, if in laboratory condition, if under laboratory conditions, we found that a good nutrition or a, sub, a supplemented nutrition was dangerous or caused more development of the parasite uh, in the field, it happens uh, something different because the hives uh, seems to be better with less uh, uh, spore counts and with more population. So from this exercise, we can conclude that the quality and the quantity of the protein can alter the development of the infection caused by Nosema serrane, but uh, there are differences between the individual response and the colony level. So you have to be cautious when you read a laboratory or semi-field assays, uh, results about this assays, and you try to uh, compare that results with um, uh, with field results or, or field behavior of the hives. And to finish, I want to show you 
this last assay related with queen replacement and nosemosis. Um, with this assay, we try to okay, we try to compare uh, a group of six hives with an old queen. This old queen is it was like uh, one and a half years, so not too old, but uh, so uh, in enough young to, to keep a productive hive, but not in enough young uh, with the strong, like the other group with bees with nine months. So we compare the evolution of the infection of the parasite in these two, um, two groups of hives during eight months. We made monthly sampling and what we sampled, we sampled 100 foraging bees and 100 young inner bees. So we took uh, bees from inside and from outside, young and forager. And what we did with these bees, well, we used 60 bees to make one of the analysis, the analysis of abundance, and 30 bees to perform, it, they, they were 25, they were not 30, the, uh, to perform the prevalence analysis. So what is abundance and prevalence? Uh, briefly, I want to show you that abundance is answering the question, how many spores in average I have in a group of pool bees? Uh, so in this case, if I have four bees, I don't know how much spores have anyone, uh, each one of them, but I know the average. Uh, Instead, the prevalence is informing us about the proportion of infected bees. So those, those results are complementary uh, because I can see here how is the percentage of parasitization. Uh, okay, so what we found. At first, if we plot the abundance of spores, so the average of spores I have in this group of 60 bees, I can see that the curve is different for the young, uh, for, for, for the bees uh, in, in, in the young queen hives um, than the one for the, sorry, um, in, the same, in the same group of hives, I can see that the foracial bees, this is the, the, the dark green, um, is a different curve that the, the quantities I can, I can find in the inner bees, that is the light green. Of course, the older bees I am sampling each month will have higher counts of spores. The particularity of this assay is was that we use humachilin in syrup at this point. Uh, it's our winter, the, the, the beginning of our winter. So we use humachilin at this point and you can see that the abundance of spores uh, was lower after the treatment, then became uh, higher, higher again, but always the quantities or almost always the quantities uh, of spores in the, in the older bees, in the forager bees, they were higher than, the, than in the inner bees. What happened if we compare, if we put over these, the curves, uh, from the hives with old queen. Okay, you can see here that the old queen foragers, old queen hives foragers, reached reached really really high levels of uh, of spore counts, almost double than the other hives, and something. Um, but but this this. Uh, this did not happen with the young bees. You can see that the young bees from the hives with old queen and from the hives with a new queen or young queen uh, are behaving almost the same. Um, okay, so we know now what happens with abundance. There is a huge peak after the treatment, a few months after the treatment. So the treatment down the, the, the spore charges but then the remaining spores inside the hive developed uh, to, to high values. Uh, and 
what happened now with the prevalence, with the percentage of infected bees? We can see here again that the percentage is higher in the forager bees compared with the inner bees in the young queen hives. But we can see here that uh, we are reaching almost 45% of infection. That, that is a lot for September, um, having in mind that we had a treatment for nosema at this point. And okay, what happened now with the old queen bees? So with the bees from all queen hives. And we can see that in here, there is interesting because uh, in the forager bees, the, the percentages are higher, of course, than in the, in the young queen uh, hives and reach more than 60% of, of, of infection. So 60% of the, of the bees, of the forager bees on that hives, there were infected with nosema. Uh, but what happened in here with the young bees, with the young from the, from, from the inner, from inside, uh, we can see here that prevalence is showing a peak also growing for inner bees. And this is interesting because at this point, when the inner bees, when, when the percentages of infection in the inner bees and the, and the forager bees uh, reach the same point, in here we can see uh, a really um, fast collapse, collapse of the hives. In, the collapse can be seen in here because we have the population along the month. And at this point in November, but, well, in, in September and August, we can see differences. But in here, the differences are huge. At this point, at this point the hives should be uh, producing honey or, or almost being ready to produce honey. And at this, at this point, the old queen hives lost uh, the um, the 30% of, of, of the hives. So from six hives, two were lost because of queen problems in here. So uh, this is interesting because, and it, uh, sorry, it was, there was a, a pretty sim similar work from IGES in Spain in 2008. And this is interesting, why? Because the replacement of queens, um, not only caused an increase in the amount of population, reduced the likelihood of losing families, and uh, seems to be associated with a, a better effectiveness of margining, but also um, the abundance and prevalence of nosemosis was re reduced. Um, why the honey production is potentially increased? Because of the population, of course, we don't have values about the honey production, but uh, looking at the, at the quantity of population of those hives, of course, the young, uh, the bees with the young, with the young, um, the hives with young queens, um, for sure will produce more honey. Um, and furthermore, the other interesting result is that the prevalence, so the percentage of the nosema infected bees could be a good predictor of colony collapse. And okay, why this is important? Because, because after these 20 years of knowledge about nosema, um, there are still a lot of interesting answers that we need. First of all, we need to know what is the best indicator to predict the impact of nosemosis in productive colonies. We need to know be, uh, by means of simple analysis, uh, which is the damage threshold and which is the proportional effect on, no, on honey production. So we need to know uh, in our place how much spores represent uh, losses in production uh, or in population. And that is something difficult to find, but if we look for uh, indicators or uh, like, like uh, for example, prevalence 
and combination with abundance at, at some point of, of the year, um, maybe we can understand how these um, parasite charges are correlated with losses in production or in, uh, or, or, or in colony losses. Uh, so what is the point in which I will lose uh, my bees or, 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 the, or, the, or the hive will be depopulated um, in, my, in my place? Uh, how can correlate uh, uh, this, this information uh, that prevalence and abundance can give me uh, with the real losses? Um, another one is what are the most effective prophylactic practices? Uh, because the replacement of material and cleaning is enough uh, to keep the, the parasite charge low in the apiary. Um, the other question is if the periodic replacement of queens is affected by itself, because we know that um, the colony is stressed when you change queens. So that stress uh, is compensated by the development of, of the hive. Uh, and the last is, okay, what treatments or substances are really effective to control the development of the parasite? How we must combine them um, without affecting the production? And of course, uh, those treatments should be safe for the consumers, uh, the environment, uh, and, the, and the bees. Um, so this is this is all. I hope not being bored, <laughs> not boring you. Um, and please, if you have any question. Thank you very much, Martin. It was a very uh, good deep dive in Nosema, one of the best that I've done uh, uh, in a while. And I'd say your English was good. Uh, you did a good job. And uh, I guess we'll move on to some questions. So I'll open it up to the panelists or anybody in the audience. If you've got questions, don't hesitate. It looks like we've got one. I'm really interested about learning about about you and, and how you manage you no know, semen there because in Argentina fumagillin is not more available. We made many uh, tests with fumagillin, but uh, now we cannot get the the product. Um, and I don't know if you are still working with with fumagillin as a common treatment. Uh, and I guess uh, some people, especially in the prairies, I guess in the prairies in Canada, they still use it. Uh, I believe your comments around the queen, replacing queens and keeping queens young is probably the one of the best approaches. And I guess for myself, uh, just to speak up a bit, uh, I find I started, especially this season, to replace a lot of old equipment because uh, I tested the feces on my frames, especially on uh, the a couple of infected hives. Uh, so Nosema up in the north is an issue here because uh, the bees are stuck in a colony for six months at least without a cleansing flight. So the feces was just chock full of Nosema and the amoeba spores. Uh, when I use scrapings, I just use a scraper, scrape the feces in a tube, added water, concentrated it and then just observed it and it was full of uh, nosema and just uh, on the cold so we get to minus 40 here uh, i had a control hive with about 60 pounds so 35 kilos of honey with no bees uh, the outside temperature got to minus 48 but the inside temperature in those frames never got much below minus 20 even at minus 40 for three weeks. So because people say, oh, your equipment gets disinfected when it gets really, really cold for dead outs, the temperature actually never really drops that much unless the, the honey is consumed. So just FYI. Uh, you, somebody said, great job. I'm thinking more about Nosema now. So that's, that's the point of the talk, good stuff. 
I guess I had a question. Have we ever seen Nosema bombay in Apis mellifera in the honeybees? The, I, I know there are some reports, but um, it's, it's not, uh, you, you cannot ensure that the parasite is affecting the bee. Okay. Uh, it's like uh, we found in, in, in our native bees, maybe we find the genetic material because we look for it uh, with molecular methods, but we don't really know if the parasite is developing and affecting the physiology of, of those species. Uh, so that's another different world. Okay, I guess for a citizen scientist like myself, to do a viability test of nosema spores. Is it difficult to get, because uh, I've got a microscope, digital camera, I've got a little centrifuge, I have a lot of stuff at home. It is, is the dye or the fluorescent dye difficult to get? Yes, it, it's not difficult to get, but uh, you need a, a specific microscope. Um, Sometimes you can, um, with the microscope and, and, and simple uh, tensions, you can identify empty spores. Those are easy to, to identify, but uh, being empty, you have three different kinds of spores. Full uh, viable spores, full not viable spores, and empty spores. So if you want to differentiate from these three kinds, you need at least two the different uh, fluorescent dyes and, and, the, and the specific fluorescent microscope to do that. Um, it's not easy. Uh, yeah, your, your, I, I would say that your best shot is maybe to infect some bees individually with a known amount of spores that you counted in, the, in your light microscope. But uh, if you want, I am thinking that you, are one, you want to check if some treatment affected those spores and you are trying to understand if they are viable or not. But this is still tricky because the reproduction of the parasite is really fast. So if some of those spores that you are testing or comparing with not treated spores, um, are still mm -hmm. viable, you will find a lot of spores in seven or eight days, and you won't find differences, um, even if you had them in the beginning. So yeah, you need the help of mm -hmm. some lab laboratory uh, uh, technician in there. Yep, sounds good, that's a challenge. A uh, couple questions. So what does destroy the spores? Okay, you know that uh, when we started with, with this research, uh, we tried uh, many things. Branch, we tried directly this dilution of, of, uh, of chloro, you know, the- Chlorine, and, Javix. And there is a, a concentration at 10 pence percent that kill the, the spores. Uh, but you have to, um, the, the, the spores should be sub submerged in, in the liquid. Uh, so the contact should be for a long time. Um, we have tried uh, sterilizing in autoclave, you know, 121 degrees and pressure. And even after that, some of them uh, looks like healthy or at least viable using these uh, specific fluorescent dyes. So we don't really know if they were still alive or not, but uh, for sure the, um, the, co the, the, the coat of the spores, there was still um, working or, or, or at least stable to keep the genetic material inside. Uh, so it's difficult to kill the spores. Uh, you know that you all know that fumagillin is acting, but just when the spore opens and release the material and is 
uh, reproducing inside the cell. So at that point, um, the, the, the parasite is exposed, but during the parasite is inside the spore, is difficult to find substances to, to, kill, to kill it. We have found some um, specific uh, fungus and, and bacteria metabolites that affects the coat. Um, but again, if you give that substances directly to the bee, you should have in mind that these substances will be also affecting the good micro microbiota, but also sometimes the epithelium and the and the tissue in, of the bee, uh, of the of the bee gut. Uh, so you are playing with fire in that in that point. But yes, of course, the fire, the flame, the flame in the the the, the material, the wooden material, and using um, caustic. Uh, Caustic soda, you know this. Um, okay, this, this, th those are two ways of killing spores in the in the material. Um, but you you should be care because this soda is toxic, and you you should use it with 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 heat, uh, with 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 cold water, with uh, hot hot water. Sorry, uh, hot water. And, and flaming using using fire in the material, uh, you can burn it if you don't don't take the, the proper care. Good. Uh, have you, I guess, for disinfecting equipment, have you experimented with acetic acid, so concentrated vinegar uh, fumigation of equipment? No, uh, the vinegar we use it. Uh, in Syrup, trying to understand if there was any effect on Nosema, and there wasn't. Uh, I can share with you some paper about it we, we published uh, last year, um, but uh, I never use it in, in the material. I just, I am friend of, of, I am friend of the fire uh, for the material because it's really fast and sometimes it's good for the for the material to receive some some flame uh, outside, um, <clears throat> and if you combine combine that with some cleaning uh, hand cleaning uh, of, of the boxes, uh, that's enough. Uh, of course, the frames is different. The frames are difficult to clean, and we mm -hmm. suggest always to replace them every two years, no more, and by new material for, for frames. Good stuff. I guess we've got a question. Uh, here it says, Nosema, is Nosema present in hives in areas of Australia, I guess, slash New Zealand, where Manuka honey is forged upon? That's the question. If Nosema is present uh, where Manuka honey is produced, um, is I, I'm not sure about, about the specific reports. Uh, I, I don't know specifically where uh, Manuka honey is produced, but in New Zealand, there is no SEMA. Uh, mm. I don't know if specifically in those places where Manuka honey is produced, but uh, you, you can find no SEMA almost everywhere. Everywhere we found, we look it for, look for it, sorry, uh, we found it. Um, maybe, not during the whole year in some places, uh, but for sure it's spread almost everywhere. Good. Let's jump in, in there. I'm, 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 I'm still awake. Uh, this is good. So I, I, I stayed up. The, the, it definitely is, is where Manuka honey is produced because we have a lot of the beekeepers using Hive Alive um, because there's Nasima there. Um, so yeah, there definitely is, is, is Nasima when, there, when there's, where there's Manuka. You're Thank strong you. in that. I don't know how you're still awake. I was good. It was a good talk. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I planned to go to sleep, but I didn't. <laughs> and I guess uh, just to, to add some comments, uh, for example, winter bees, especially here. So they're, they're winter for six months. And then uh, I usually trigger brood rearing with pollen patties or natural pollens when they start. And then the aging process starts. And like you mentioned, within two to three weeks, 
if it's a severely infected colony, it collapses. So I've had frame colonies with 10 frames of bees collapse to nothing in less than one month. So that's, we don't have uh, long winters in, in my place, but in the south of Argentina, where there are at least four months of, uh, of snow. So the, the hives are covered by snow uh, for, for that time. Um, and they are having similar problems. Um, the fact is that it's really difficult to know how the, the next uh, build up or, or how, how the next season will be. If maybe if you have uh, this, this long time uh, of, of winter and then you have um, um, a, a nice spring um, and, 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 and the bees uh, which overwintered are, are well uh, nourished, uh, of course the build up will be, uh, will be easier. Uh, I think at that point, um, the the only the the only thing that you can do to ensure the 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 strong the strong of that bees is feeding them before they are wintering. I don't know if that that is a common practice. If you left honey or if you um, I don't know. We are recommending to to these people in in the south of Argentina uh, leave a lead at least one supper of honey um, and feed uh, with protein or pollen patties uh, before wintering. I don't know if some, some, some of those um, things, uh, if you are performing something similar. I am, so I do that. And this is where I discovered the co-infection with amoeba disease so and the mortality in front of the colony during winter so i see big piles the colonies that will collapse have big piles of dead bees in front of them during winter so high winter mortality and then in the spring they still have lots of bees but then they all die really quick what about and, no and i was just going to say they i've had colonies with nosema but no amoeba and they they can actually ramp up and and do well and uh so it's just uh an observation that i've over the last five years six years where i've seen and this is where my your comments around cleaning equipment and destroying spores comes in is i think i've linked it to contaminated equipment and uh, what about um, the spore charges in those dead bees? Did you check for dead bees? Uh, those dead bees out, outside the, the hive? Oh, yes. So ah, I, this. I, the, all the dead bees had nosema and amoeba. And sometimes the healthier colonies. So one will have like a 500, 600 dead bees in a month. The other one will have maybe five to 10 dead bees in a month. So those bees sometimes have nosema, the healthy one, but the very sick one has severe nosema and severe amoeba. Now I understand. Now, now, now I understand. The, the, um, so the, the, um, this association between this, those two parasites is interesting. Uh, it's really interesting. I, I hope you found so you find someone helping you with that in, in, in there because it's really interesting to know uh, if this combination is causing more problems than each one separately. And I think places with no cleansing flights during winter, it becomes critical because amoeba affects the, the kidneys of the bees, the malgib, malpigian tubules. So it, yeah. I don't know how to say it. So <laughs> say, so anyways, it affects the kidneys of the bees, so it affects how they can manage water. And then it really causes them pain. So anyways, I'll leave the floor open. I'll see if there's other questions. Ron, did you have any questions?
Yeah, I, I have a couple questions actually, um, and they may be pretty trivial. So um, in one of the classes that I, I was teaching, one of the um, beekeepers said that they had heard, read, seen evidence or information regarding using very, very thin syrup to feed to the bees in order to cleanse their guts. And in fact, you know, almost to the point of being water. Do you or anyone else in the panel have any insight in that? Uh, I just can comment that we have tried many substances and we realized that uh, in some cases, some substances work well for nosema because the bees defecated a lot. But I don't know, we don't know until which point that is good or not because um, this release of, uh, of, of course, the, the spores uh, also accelerates the release of the microbiota of the, uh, from, from the bee but also uh, accelerates the regeneration or the, or the liberation of, of um, pieces of, of the gut, of the mid gut, uh, into the light of, 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 of the gut. And it's like uh, when, when it's like a dysentery, a forced dysentery. Um, you can maybe, useful to test that but you should be careful uh, when you administer this kind of syrup you cannot do it uh, of course uh, during during uh, cold periods because uh, the energy that took to a bee to evaporate the water right. from the high right. is like uh, you you are forcing the the, the bee to uh, too much, I think. Yes. Uh, but it will be really interesting to hear about it if someone is trying something similar. Yes, I don't don't know that I would try it, but um, but I was asked that question. I promised to talk to an expert, and we have the expert here. So so I thought I should throw that question out. Um, so thank you for that, and and thank you for the whole presentation. Actually, it was very very interesting and very in depth. Um, there was one point in the presentation that um, that I kind of probably didn't didn't pay sharp enough attention. But if you don't mind, could you explain again when you catch forager bees to test them? Um, you said that uh, you catch them at the entrance. So you block the entrance, the bees start to pile up, and then you collect some bees there. And it has something to do with the contents of the hind gut. Um, could you elaborate? Just a little bit on that, how, how you do that and why that's important. Okay, yes. Um, we, have, we have seen that when we sample the hives continuously, uh, there, are, there is a huge variability because it's not the same if you sample the hive in the morning, in the midday or in the afternoon. It's not the same if you sample on Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. So trying to um, diminish this um, deviation in the counts, uh, we realize that uh, a good sampling uh, and, 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 and com comparable, uh, so that we can compare uh, between samplings in one or two or three weeks is to uh, get the bees, the forager bees that are coming from flight. But always uh, in, in the maximum flying hour. So um, we standardize at that point to compare the counts in our city with the counts in uh, um, cities in other places in the country. So during the maximum flight, you close the entrance, uh, the forager bees that are coming, are, are tired, they want sting, they want, uh, they, they will be, they will try to get into the hive really fast. So they generate uh, groups of bees, of a lot of bees in, in a sh really, really short period. Like in one minute, you can get, I don't know, 200, 300, or maybe more bees in there. Um, and those uh, bees, uh, only, only, only have 
the spores in the midgut, not the ones that they accumulated in the hindwing. So in there, we can avoid maybe variation uh, because when you get bees from the suburbs or from the uh, outside of the cluster, maybe you get older bees some of them will be with the with a full hindwood or with an empty uh, hindwood. So in there you have millions of spores and the counts will be really variable. Uh, so the best chance you have to compare your information, uh, if you took this huge world that is processing the bees and counting them and count the spores. Um, uh, so you need to, to, to you need to, to try to, to, to keep just these older bees with the empty hindwood. Uh, and the easy way we have found to, to catch them is to cover the, the entrance sometimes with, um, I don't know, you, you can use many things, but sometimes we use a mesh uh, and we make a kind of cylinder with the mesh, with the plastic mesh, and we cover the entrance just with that. So the mm -hmm. airflow keep going, uh, but the bees cannot get into. And then you have a big glass or a bottle, plastic bottle cut it, and you put just uh, a small quantity of ethanol, pure ethanol from the pharmacy in there, but not a lot, just one finger or less. And you catch them flying. You don't need to use even a brush or nothing. You, you just catch them flying. Uh, it's, it's not tricky, it's easy to do. And we are used to do huge uh, uh, samplings um, in, in really, really short period. That sounds great. Plus, uh, it's a perfect way to standardize uh, your bees then too. So, so that's, thank you very much. No, you're welcome. It's a good, really good question. Just another question. Uh, is anyone working on a quick test for nosema diagnosis, non-microscopic, like uh, the, the VITA, like the EFB, AFB test that you can buy? Is there anything for nosema coming? Yeah, I, I know there is people working on that, but uh, I, have, I have never tested none of them yet. Uh, I think it's important to find something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> there is this um, this, quest, this question about if the quantity of spores is representative of the impact of the disease in the hive. Because sometimes um, I think Randy Oliver has uh, really nice information about it, or maybe a compilation of information about it. Um, because many times the percentage of infection is showing more than the, than than just a number of spores and an average number, average number. Because because of this that that uh, Ron asked uh, before, uh, it's difficult to standardize the quantity of spores. But if you know uh, how many bees in your um, age group of young or older bees uh, are infected, maybe you can uh, understand better and predict better what will happen with this hive at this moment, at that moment of the year, uh, at that, at that uh, point of the year. Uh, so it's not the same, 50% of, of young bees infected in before winter than uh, have them uh, before summer, you know. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I guess uh, we'll do a couple more questions and then we'll call it a night. Uh, do you know if rendered wax, so when people melt down the wax off old frames, if they're infected with nosema, and then they use that wax probably to re reapply wax on foundation, is there a risk of contamination there? No, I think the risk, the risky thing about that is uh, the, the residues of uh, acaricides. <laughs> but uh, the spores won't survive to the temperature of, uh, you know, when- Melted yeah, wax. Yeah, the wax or 
paraffina, you know, I don't know how to say it in yeah, English. Yeah, paraffin. Okay, paraffin. Yes, when you uh, use paraffin to cover the, the wooden material, uh, the spores, maybe some spores can remain in the, uh, in the spaces, in, in, the, in the wood, but uh, for sure the, the most of, 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 the, of the infected uh, charge uh, is lost. So, uh, or, or, or uh, the temperature is too high uh, and, and for sure they won't be viable uh, after that treatment. Uh, no, I think the, the problem with that is the, I don't know how many receipts of a site you have. Uh, we know that we have, but we don't know how much uh, receipts we have in the, in the works we buy, uh, in, the, in the new works uh, that we use for the, for the frames. Uh, that's that's the I think the, the the bigger problem. Good, uh, and I guess just to confirm, we've got a, an attendee, uh, Frank Lindsay. He's from New Zealand, uh, and he does mention around Nosima in New Zealand. It's in the Q and A, and uh, sometimes we have apiaries die out in three weeks. Two boxes full of bees, and then he continues. Uh, they're seeing die-offs of quality spreading further each year. So, and the information is from Hawks Bay Beekeeper. Uh, and I guess the final question in the Q&A uh, has to do the difference between uh, Nosema Apis and Serana. And is it correct that the bees from Nosema Serana disappear because they fly far away from the beehive? And Nosema apis die in front of the colony crawling. So I'll, I'll I'll just mention quickly in my case because it's minus twenty outside, the bees die in front. They they just die, so they can't fly. So that's why for me it's beautiful because they'll die right in front, and then I can sample them, and it's easy to do. Uh, but places where they have cleansing flights or warmer temperatures. Like on a warmer day, they'll fly off and die far from the colony. Yes, I don't know. I don't know about uh, published information about it, but um, it will be interesting to analyze. We yep. we we try many times to find uh, nosimapis spores, but fresh nosimapis spores, not contaminated with nosima serrani, and it was impossible. Uh, I don't know. I think the, 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 there is no more uh, Nosema, just Nosema apis, uh, at least easy to find. Um, so you can find Nosema serrani and a lot of Nosema serrani spores, but it's at least for us and, and the, the persons we know are around the world uh, to get some um, just clean and, and, and and a nice sample of, of Nosema apis spores. You purify, isn't it? I've had my bees tested for the, since 2016 and it's only been Sarane. And that's through PCR tests, so never apis. Yeah. yeah. Good, so I think everybody's tired, especially Dara. Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us. It was very much appreciated. Uh, so there is a recording of this presentation, so I'll make sure I send you the link. You can share with anybody you want. It'll be an unlisted YouTube, YouTube, so you can share it if you like. Uh, and uh, just for the folks that are still here, so there's still, uh, let's see, how many of us? 36 of us, which is good. Uh, the next talk is October 19th. It'll be Dr. Tarpy and Michael Palmer. And there's going to be a connection to Queens there. And I think Mog Michael Palmer will talk about his uh, resource colonies and how he uses uh, smaller sets to help maintain his numbers, grow his bee numbers, and uh, maintain healthy populations by pulling resources off of smaller colonies. So, uh, and I guess just so you know, November will probably have one speaker, TBA, and that'll be our annual meeting. Uh, and then we'll discuss 
these mini conferences continuing? Is it something you like? If you do, uh, we'll make an effort to keep them going. Uh, potential for in-person next year. I'll put out a questionnaire and then uh, I guess, yeah, it'll be, I need help running these. So I've been running these uh, solo. Uh, I get help uh, putting speakers together, but from the technical perspective, running the Zoom and running the website and stuff like that. So for anybody out there uh, willing to help me out, uh, it would be very much appreciated. I'm happy to teach folks about technology and Zoom and websites. Just reach out to me at yukonhoneybees.com or gmail.com and uh, it, it would be great. So anyways, Martin, thank you very much. Dara, sleep well. And everybody, thank you very much for uh, sticking it out. <laughs>